Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting us to participate in this important uh, webinar. We are delighted to have the opportunity to, uh, to share with you today our experiences with providing psychological support to healthcare workers during the Danish COVID-19 epidemic. And we will start with a brief introduction to, to Denmark and to the Danish healthcare system in order to explain the, uh, the, the context. Denmark is a small uh, kingdom. This is the Queen's castle in uh, our capital, uh, Copenhagen. Next slide, please. And Denmark is, is a very small uh, country on the very top of uh, Europe. Uh, our population is 5.8 uh, million in inhabitants. Next slide, please. The, the cornerstones of the Danish healthcare system is universal coverage. All Danes have free and equal access to, uh, to healthcare. The Danish healthcare system is, is a public healthcare system finan financed by general taxes and uh, our healthcare system has a very high degree of uh, decentralization. We have three levels, administrative level in our levels in our healthcare system. The national level um, <clears throat> with the, the Ministry of Health, the regional level with five Danish regions, and uh, Christina and I belongs to the very top of uh, uh, the five re regions in region North uh, Denmark. The regions, they uh, own and run the Danish hospitals. And then we have a local level with uh, 98 municipalities, which uh, takes care of uh, basically uh, prevention and also uh, home care. Next slide, please. With regard to uh, COVID-19, uh, Denmark experienced a lockdown on March uh, 13, and uh, the first regulation was actually that uh, hospitals should uh, stop all unnecessary uh, treatment, and that was, for example, operation and and also um, routine um, uh, examinations. Or everything was uh, postponed. I would say that uh, the Danish healthcare system was very uh, unprepared. Uh, to uh, to COVID-19, as many other uh, countries, there was uh, a lack of uh, protective uh, equipment, ventilators, swabs, uh, uh, etc. So the Danish healthcare system has been challenged uh, during uh, COVID-19, but not challenged to uh, the same degree as we just have heard from Barcelona or from Bergamo or from uh, Wuhan, but it has been uh, being challenged. In, uh, in our region, we, region North Denmark, we uh, established a COVID-19 task force, including the board of uh, directors from the hospitals and also emphasizing the general practitioners. And we uh, decided to establish uh, psychological support to all our healthcare workers. And I will uh, hand over, over to our chief psychologist, Christina Moore Jensen, who will uh, explain the psychological support in further details. So please, Christina. Thanks very much. And um, yeah, actually, it follows quite nicely from, um, from the talk or a part of the talk that we just heard from Clara about the, the, the healing environment and the psychological aspects of uh, working as a healthcare professional uh, during a pandemic. So we know that epidemic crises are, it's, is some of the most stressful uh, thing you can, uh, you can put humans through. And uh, that in particular counts if you're a, a healthcare professional, because you have a job to, uh, to handle and uh, um, work during the pandemic. You can't just stay at home. 
And um, during the initial phases of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, from Wuhan, we have learned, uh, put numbers to uh, how stressful and uh, it can be to work as a healthcare professional. So we have some initial findings from Wuhan that showed that a substantial proportion of the healthcare workers had symptoms of stress, anxiety and depression at above clinical uh, cutoff levels. We know from previous uh, epidemics that most of, uh, of these symptoms subside once uh, the the danger is, is over, but we also know that some persist and some turn into other issues and, and problems. And it's not just a problem for the uh, individual healthcare worker, but also um, to a large extent, the hospital and uh, the healthcare system in general, because we know that when you subject people to prolonged uh, physical and mental stresses, uh, maybe even have traumatic experiences, the risk of burning out and um, becoming stressed and traumatized increases. And it also uh, diminishes just our ability to be uh, uh, empathic. Uh, and we know it's associated with staff turnover, errors in work. So it's actually very, very important that we focus on healthcare workers' uh, mental health for the sake of the the worker, but also the patient and uh, and the healthcare system in in general. So um, I'll just yeah. So in an attempt to sort of respond to the the, the crisis, we um, developed uh, a plan to to try to support or, or provide additional support to the healthcare workers in the northern region of Denmark. Um, we were able to open the service uh, at April 1st, and uh, it was a joint collaboration between psychologists, nurses, security uh, managers, etc. All sort of um, backgrounds and coming from all over the region. So within our region, we have hospitals uh, at various sites, and we sort of had representatives from each site and sort of merged our uh, um, time and energy to create sort of a central unit uh, from where we would provide this uh, additional support. Because um, we, in situations like this, we need to make use of existing resources and build on the existing structures that are already there. Um, and uh, so it was like a joint effort to, to set up the service. And uh, this service uh, naturally also um, pr would provide assistance to to all uh, staff within the region. So everyone from the janitor to the head doctor to the secretary in the communication department and from all over the region. And um, just briefly, um, the, uh, the concept of it was that a manager could, um, of course, uh, would accept from a uh, a member of, uh, of his staff or um, request help for him or herself um, at our central uh, psychosocial uh, response team. Um, and there were three entry points to this same central unit. And um, you could either send an email to a central uh, inbox where we read referrals, discussed and distributed cases and, and made sort of uh, an intervention plan um, based on the specific referral. Uh, we did that every day during weekends and holidays too. There was also an option to call a work environment hotline if you, for instance, as a manager or, an, or a nurse needed uh, a, a, some advice about how do we handle uh, that uh, a member of staff has been in, infected or stuff like that. And then finally, we had like an, an emergency mental health hotline in case that some very critical incidents would come up or um, some members of staff would have a very severe um, psychological uh, reaction to, let's say, uh, losing a, a child or a number of patients during a day. Because we know that um, if uh, 
for instance, you experience too much, too many uh, deaths or traumatic incidents, you know, there is a risk of an acute breakdown. So we had a 24-7 open hotline uh, for these emergency situations. And for all referrals and incoming calls, we um, we assessed them for level of severity and need and, and then matched and, uh, the intensity and the type of intervention uh, to that specific referral. And just briefly a little bit about uh, the activity. Um, so from March to August, we had uh, we delivered uh, psychological support uh, on an individual basis to uh, some 81 uh, individuals, typically two to three sessions, um, and then to have approximately 30 groups. And uh, yeah, as is evident from the slide here, a group could be five, it could be 50 plus uh, people. Um, and we did see uh, like an inter interesting uh, development or an important development, I think, for for our future learning. So during spring and summer, um, we primarily got referrals concerning uh, nurses working in anesthesiology and ICUs. And the reason why it's it's it says working is because many of these people were either moved from their original uh, position position or department to uh, to fill in either at our pandemic department or uh, to fill in for uh, someone who was moved to a pandemic department. And from summer and, and at this moment, we see a much more mixed group of, uh, of, of professional backgrounds uh, coming from a more mixed group of departments. We see this uh, graph here uh, where the um, the the lighter blue um, columns uh, represent the number of patients who were admitted uh, to the hospital uh, with due to COVID-19 and the darker blue shows the number of referrals we got and it shows a quite interesting and an important pattern and that is that many of these reactions to working during a pandemic they don't come in the acute phase they don't follow the, the number of referrals and psychological reactions does not follow the uh, the curve of of, of deaths or um, or um, hospitalized patients. We often, very often, see a delay uh, in reactions. Um, this is just a sample of of what we learned from uh, the the various conversations that we had with people. Uh, Many of them had a mixture of uh, emotional ability, feeling shame and guilt, feeling stressed, restless, having uh, cognitive problems such as memory problems, uh, anger, fear of being weak, uh, going insane, or, or being damaged from from uh, from doing uh, one's job, and. Um, I think the most important and interesting thing is to, to reflect a little bit on what then why. Why do people who are typically used to dealing with very uh, large amounts of stress during a non-pandemic um, uh, time, why do they sort of all of a sudden react like this? And uh, I think uh, if we need to sum it all up, we need to take a look at uh, some very basic psychology from uh, the Maslow pyramid of uh, uh, of hierarchy of, of needs. Um, so in the bottom we have our physiological needs for sleep and rest and food and drink, our needs for safety, uh, social needs, etc. And what we learn from many of uh, the conversations we have with people is that it's not one stressor. It's it's sort of the sum of stressors on the some of the lower level of, of human basic needs, a lack of breaks, uh, either because there were no uh, time to eat or drink the rest, or it was really just uh, seen as too bothersome or time consuming for the, the, the this particular member of staff to to get out of the, the personal um, protective equipment to, to have a break. Uh, lack of spare time, feeling like you're always on call. Um, and um, 
also struggles between, you know, your different roles, like being a mom and being a nurse, feeling that those roles come into conflict with each other. Fear of catching COVID-19 at work or uh, in your spare time and, and bringing it, it home. So it's um, it has very much to do also with distressed uh, safety needs. Also, like... Uh, feeling uh, that you can count on your co-workers, but the more exhausted and uh, tired and um, filled up you get as a person, the the less energy you have to 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 be a, a good co-worker and and chat with each other. So so basically, we we understand that a lot of these reactions that we saw in the staff uh, was the result of. Uh, um, not having the the basic human needs for uh, uh, the physiological needs and psychological needs for safety and uh, and and the social needs covered, and I think there are some quite important lessons uh, to this. Um, we know that when we are under pressure as human beings, we are inclined to pri prioritize the now and the very practical and concrete problems. Do we have enough personal uh, protective equipment, enough ventilators? Um, we're not very good at when we're under pressure to prepare for the long run. Um, but I think an important lesson is that we really need uh, to focus and learn uh, to have um, really to prioritize the basic uh, human fundamental needs. Uh, we tend to forget the importance of sleep and rest and food uh, during our everyday lives, but it becomes so important in, in times like this. Um, and I also think we need to uh, value and also prepare managers, the whole hospital, um, really to focus on an encouraging uh, behaviors that support uh, you being able to uh, perform during a long distance, uh, which COVID-19 really has proven to be, rather than sprinting. So it's really nice to have staff that takes the extra shift, but you also need to learn people uh, not to become too self-sacrificing. Um, because in the end, you run, you end up having uh, a staff that can't give those extra 10 percent, um, even though you may need it because they sort of uh, run their batteries flat. Um, we were fortunate to uh, collaborate across the entire uh, region, and I would really uh, encourage other places to, to also think of um, preparing for setting up services like that by mapping, you know, what what kind of uh, people can do what kind of things to support staff during uh, potentially future future crises. Um, and then I think I'll actually turn uh, the attention to you again, uh, Jan, because you also uh, have some of this uh, summed up in, in your slide. So um, what we learned from uh, COVID-19 uh, in, uh, in our region was that uh, psychological support to uh, healthcare workers during an ep uh, epidemic is, uh, is essential. And um, psychological support is the responsibility of leaders on all levels in our uh, healthcare care system. And we think it is very important that uh, psychological support actually um, is on the agenda uh, during a healthcare uh, crisis, as in the same way, way uh, as we have on the agenda the question of um, how many ventilators do we have, how much swap do we have, and how much uh, much uh, projective equipment uh, do we have. This is very uh, important. And actually, this is our last uh, slide. So thank you very much for your at atten attention. And if you have any uh, question, uh, questions, comments, or reflections, we will be uh, delighted to uh, to address them either here today uh, or by uh, by mail.
So uh, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, to do so. Thank you.